Thanks for uh, having me, and uh, I'm sorry not to be there in person. I was able to catch a little bit of the conference on video, and um, I was envious of you all for being together. Um, at the moment, uh, I'm like many other people, been sort of working remotely for a long time. Uh, so whatever the, the technology, um, I hope that my thoughts, uh, even if they're kind of remote, will help you as you're thinking about a better future for Alberta. And I look forward to the discussion after my prepared remarks. Uh, when Danny approached me, he asked me to talk about the State of Canada's Federation and how we might work together to keep it from fracturing any further. Uh, I've got, I think, 45 minutes for this session, and what I thought I should do is use no more than half of it to get some of my own thoughts in front of you, and then uh, turn it over to you, and I hope the technology will hold up for any questions that you have or any comments that you want to make. Uh, because I, I always like that part of the conversation and it's always good because uh, uh, then at least uh, when I'm talking, I know that what I'm saying is interesting to at least one person uh, other than myself. Uh, I wasn't able to attend all of the conference, but I was able to uh, uh, attend parts of it and, and to read some of the material. Uh, so because we're fairly laid on in the conference, I thought I should just uh, kind of register a couple of things, um, not surprisingly at all, a, a lot of impatience, uh, not just with Ottawa, uh, which I certainly get, but with uh, politics as usual. And I know many of you, maybe most of you, are wondering about Alberta's future in Canada. Um, I, I'll, I'll just remark at the beginning, uh, going to some of the specific things that God said, uh, the violation of rights and the disproportionality of the lockdown. I'm not going to make any comment there, except that... Um, I will say that I personally support John uh, and the Justice, John Carpe and the, and the Justice Center. Uh, my brother pitched you yesterday on supporting some of the think tanks and other non-political organizations that keep the right kind of fires burning. Uh, so I do think the Justice Center is doing a good job. I hope you'll think good thoughts about uh, it, uh, as well as the Montreal Economic Institute and the Fraser Institute, Canada West, and of course the C.D. Howe Institute uh, itself, because we're all uh, working to get ideas out there that are different from what we hear from our governments and what we hear from much of the media. Um, I, I, I got the part of the discussion about cities. I want to pick up a couple of points uh, there later on because that's uh, very important. And it sort of complements a lot of the things that I was going to say about fiscal federalism, which is really what Danny and I talk most about. It's a favorite topic of mine. Uh, and um, you had uh, Germain Belzil talk a lot about that, and I think a lot of what I'm going to say is be very going to be very complementary to, uh, to to what you heard. And then maybe I should also just uh, uh, make a reference to what Barry Cooper uh, said about economics, um, you know, not being the whole story. Uh, and I'm sorry that it isn't, because if economics mattered more, if if the economic arguments were the ones that really resonated with people. Uh, we'd all be more prosperous and we would treat each other better and Alberta would have a happier and a more secure position in Canada. Uh, but as uh, Barry said, Brexit wasn't really about economics. Um, Quebec secession wasn't about economics. If the economic arguments had mattered more, uh, there wouldn't have been any close uh, referendum. And in Alberta's case, the economic irritants are more front and centre and I think addressing them would make a bigger difference. So uh, that's kind of my area is economics, and, and I thought that maybe a good theme for what I'm about to say would be uh, federalism, uh, you know, why it would be a good thing, uh, why real federalism would be a good thing for Alberta and for Canada. So let me sort of explain why I start that way, and I know I might be going uh, against some of the sentiment at the conference, but uh, I will start by saying that in a screwed up world, uh, and leaving aside how we could make Canada better or maybe design an independent Alberta that it'd be better. But if you just look at the countries that currently exist in the state that they are right now, uh, Canada's pretty good. Uh, the vast majority of the countries in the world aren't ones where any of us would want to live and raise a family. And among the few where we would, Canada ranks pretty high. And it's also one of the few where we would want to work and invest. I'm not saying it's good enough. It's not. And especially right now, we've got to do a lot better uh, than we've been doing the last few years. But as I say, in a screwed up world, it's one of the better ones. And I'm not starting with that just to be argumentative or, or, or provoke you. It's because I think there's a reason which is really central to why you're uh, attending this conference. 
And it's because Canada has been one of the more decentralized federations in the world. It's been a genuine federation, and that has worked well in a whole lot of ways. It has made us flexible. It's accommodated differences among people and livelihoods and regional outlooks. Uh, it's uh, not as rare as I'd like it to be for Canadians to go to the United States for economic opportunities, uh, but it's rare for Canadians to live, uh, rare for people to leave Canada for any other reason, and 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 way more people come to Canada than leave it. Uh, I think that being a genuine federation has made us durable. Uh, Quebec did not vote to secede. Uh, we made it to 150 years old, which is older than most countries. And I don't think that's an accident. I don't think we would have made it that far as a unitary state. Uh, I'm a huge believer that uh, federalism is, is the right way for a country to organize itself. Um, Germain Belzil talked about the virtues of uh, doing things as close to the people as possible, the idea of subsidiarity. Uh, I would add to that sort of underlying accountability that when you've got governments that are sovereign in their own spheres, uh, you should certainly in principle uh, know who gets the credit when things go well and who gets the blame when things go badly. And I think uh, Germain touched on this as well, that when you've got competition among governments, um, it's usually good for freedom as well. Uh, it's like markets. Uh, and if you look around the world, I don't think it is a coincidence that federal countries, including the United States, Australia, Germany, you might put UK on that list, but they tend to be the ones that we kind of compare ourselves to for quality of life. Now, there are lots of problems with being a federation, but I think sometimes it's just that the problems that exist sometimes in unitary states just get a bit more obvious in federations. Uh, we've got barriers inside the country. We've got a fragmented market. Uh, we've got regional tensions. Um, but I'll, I'll say that in federations, I think the, the fact that there's a bit more transparency, those things show a bit more readily. Sometimes it makes them uh, easier to deal with. Um, what, is, what is bad in my mind and, and getting us closer to the problems is that you often hear people talk about federations in Canada uh, using words like patchwork, and they advocate for national programs, uh, Medicare in the past, um, daycare, pharmacare. Uh, you just had a, a very powerful couple of presentations on the environment. And uh, I think that one of the hugest weaknesses that we have in Canada is this tendency to look uh, to the national government to impose uniformity. There was a famous quote from a BC premier more than a century ago. So paraphrasing that, you might say that Edmonton is 3,500 kilometers from Ottawa, but Ottawa is 35,000 kilometers from Edmonton. And um, you often uh, see people not just looking at, to the national government for some of the things that we would say the national government should take care of, um, including, for example, having an internal market where people can buy and sell and work and invest anywhere in the country. Um, but also things like national industrial policies and social programs and all kinds of things where you've got preferences across the country that are different um, and they're just looking for a stronger national government to wield a bigger hammer uh, to make sure that the outcomes are all the same. And at the moment, I'm very concerned about this, as I am sure uh, you are as well, that we've got the combined health and economic crisis of COVID-19 that have made people a bit reflexive about supporting governments, including Ottawa. And some federal institutions have done an okay job. I mean, the Bank of Canada steps in when there's a crisis like this. Uh, Ottawa sure has shown that it's good at borrowing and spending. Um, but in the aftermath of this, we're going to be uh, you know, doing a post-mortem that's going to show, among other things, that the feds weren't as good at the things that they should have been good at, like keeping the virus out of Canada in the first place. And they've been overreaching in all kinds of ways uh, that are going to exacerbate some problems, including the ones that uh, motivated you to come together at this conference. So that's quite high level. Um, let me uh, just drill down on a few areas that I, I know are on people's minds. Um, one of the things that uh, I worked on a lot in the past is, is the Alberta pension plan. And I, if I were uh, in Alberta, would definitely want to keep the fire burning under that. An Alberta pension plan can work. Uh, it's a long time. A few, it was Stogwell Day, who was treasurer, when I was uh, doing some modeling uh, on how an Alberta pension plan uh, could work. So that is a fair way back. And the Canada pension plan has grown another layer since then. But there are many things that were true then that are true now. 
Um, there's a big unfunded liability in the Canada Pension Plan, so it needs younger people with future earnings to pay the promises that it made already. And that means that if you're a province with a younger, higher earning population, which Alberta is, uh, then you can deliver the same benefits for lower contributions. People have said, well, yeah, but what if that advantage fades over time? Uh, it could, but a strong starting position has a lasting effect. And so it is true now uh, that Alberta could deliver the same benefits at a lower contribution rate. Another thing that has gotten a bit less attention, but thinking about federalism, you can tweak the plan to suit the provincial circumstances. And Quebec with the Quebec Pension Plan has done that in some important ways. Uh, they've done things, for example, to make it work better with their disability programs. They've done things because Quebec's an older population. They are facing that demographic uh, wall uh, earlier than other provinces. And so they've adjusted some of the bonuses and the penalties that apply if you take your benefits later early. And if you think that Alberta would use those tools wisely, then they are good to have. Um, now, on the subject of having tools that are good if you use them wisely, an Alberta pension plan would mean that Alberta would control the investments in the plan by itself. Uh, is that a good or a bad thing? Well, if you're smart, if you keep costs down and you avoid making politically driven investments, uh, then that could be a good thing. Uh, but you might not be smart. And so that's a big question mark. And I think it's one of the things that people need to get comfortable with. You want to have that option. As I say, I would keep that fire burning if I were you. Um, but you want to get comfortable with that if you're going to pull the trigger on that one. Uh, high profile fiscal arrangements, uh, Fed prop transfers, are I think one of the main reasons that um, Danny asked me to participate in this conference. I do have a comment about equalization. So if there's a formal equalization program, up equalization with a capital E, and that one's a lightning rod, uh, as you know, it was front and center in the fair deal panel. Um, one of the things though that uh, troubles me about that focus is that the constitutional commitment to equalization doesn't commit us uh, to that program. It's not at all the same uh, to say that you are going to have uh, programs that are going to allow governments to offer reasonably comparable services at reasonably comparable levels of taxation. That is a very long way from saying you're going to have a program like the upper, you know, the, the, the capital E equalization program that we have now. Uh, my brother John said at the beginning of the conference, uh, almost nobody understands it uh, anymore. Uh, but one thing that we do know about it is that it has a fundamental flaw. When an equalization receiving province improves its economic performance, its transfers fall. So it's kind of like a welfare wall and it encourages gaming the system. It's not a well-designed program. Um, but we don't need to amend the constitution to get rid of it. Uh, there are other things that you can do and there are other ways that you can even out the fiscal capacity among the different provinces, including things that we already do. Uh, and the, the the main one, and I like it because it's more transparent and it's straightforward, is just when the federal government channels some of its tax revenues to provinces with equal per person transfers. That is a fair way of doing it. It solves some of the inequality problems if, if they trouble you. Uh, and it's way better than the formal equalization program. So I think it's we, ha we have to deal with it, but I think sometimes people get hung up on the constitutional aspect. Uh, the Constitution doesn't require us to have that program. We could change it uh, pretty radically. I do want to say, though, on the subject of the other Fed prop transfers, that we're already a very, very long way down that road. It's normal in federations for the national government to take in more revenue than it uses for its own purposes and transfer some of it to the subnational, like the U.S. does it to the states and Australia does it as well. Um, but in Canada, we've gone a very, very long way. Um, before this crisis hit, even transfers to other governments were about one third of uh, the federal government's program spending and about one fifth of the revenues of the recipient governments. And that's just too much. Governments in a federation are supposed to be sovereign in their own spheres, but as you all know, money talks. He who pays the piper calls the tune. And I think, I mean, I'll just go again to uh, John, my brother's uh, comment about people's unwillingness to reform Medicare. Uh, how much worse is it when the feds can say that healthcare is provincial, but the provinces can say that it's the feds fault for not funding uh, them enough? You blur accountability and you undercut the benefits of federalism when the provinces have become that dependent on the um, federal government. You got a very good presentation earlier 
on how Quebec has opted out of some federal transfers. And I think that there are very important lessons, great lessons there for Alberta about uh, doing some of the same things, maybe making common causes with other provinces. Uh, The first thing you have to do, though, is to not accept any new ones. Uh, Before COVID hit, and we're going to be hearing about it again uh, before long, we're going to have the federal government dangling some bait out there uh, for a national pharmacare program. And if the provinces take the money, we know from history what will happen. Uh, They'll start with a fair amount of money flowing, and there will be strings attached. One day, though, the transfers will get cut, but the strings will still be there. And it's much better for the provinces to take the tax room, uh, tax points, if that's uh, an arrangement that uh, uh, is on offer. Uh, One way or another, though, uh, Alberta will be much better off uh, if it takes the tax room rather than the money. Uh, But, of course, you do have to say no to the money. And I think that would be a great place to start, say no to that money, because uh, Quebec's going to say no. Uh, you won't, the pro- Alberta wouldn't be the only problem saying no. And if you practice saying no there, then you'll be ready to say no to some other things. Because the big picture here is that we need Ottawa to get smaller. Uh, the provinces are responsible for the big ticket items. Uh, they're the ones that are going to be uh, uh, important in the future, and they're going to be expensive in the future. Provinces do infrastructure much more than the feds do. Provinces are responsible for education. And most importantly, they are responsible for health care. And uh, you know, uh, it's true everywhere. It's been very much of a problem in Alberta, the way that health care budgets uh, were rising. Uh, very hard to keep under control because we can do more for people and the population is aging. Uh, and um, Alberta should not be one of the provinces that's begging the feds for more money. Alberta should be a province that is telling the feds to get out of the way. Uh, let me, because I um, saw what Marcel Latouche uh, uh, said earlier, just say that um, uh, when it comes to relations between provinces and cities, a lot of the same things that I've just said apply. It's not the same formal federal structure. There's no constitution, but we see many of the same problems when provinces undermine the autonomy of their, their cities. I think Marcel, he, he preempted one of my uh, favorite guessing games with the numbers, but if you remember, uh, if you ask somebody who's, who's not looked at the numbers uh, and you tell them Calgary's expenses last year were about $4 billion, how big was its surplus? And then you tell them it was a billion dollars. Um, you know, like 20 cents, more than 20 cents of every dollar Calgary raised, uh, they didn't need for their expenses that year. They ran a big surplus. Edmonton's not that much different. Uh, Edmonton has about $3 billion in expenses uh, because we're, this isn't as interactive as it would be if I were in the room. I won't ask you to guess, but I wonder if, how many people know. Uh, Edmonton's surplus last year was $600 million, a massive surplus. And these are cities that have been in hard times now for years. Why does this happen? Well, it happens because uh, partly because the province won't let cities in Alberta uh, budget properly for capital. And so the cities, they tax too much. And if you look at their balance sheets, they've got all this cash. They have cash when they should have been building roads and bridges and sewers, and they should have been taxing less. So that's a bit of a digression, but it's on point in the sense that we would all be better off if we insisted that each level of government focuses on the services that it can provide best and got out of the way of the others. Now, I said I was going to keep my prepared remarks uh, to no more than half the time. So um, let me just note uh, how the coronavirus has kind of amplified these financial stresses and then um, get back to the major theme of Alberta's future, which I hope it has in, in Canada. Um, first of all, with respect to uh, what's happened because of the coronavirus, uh, all governments have hyperextended themselves, uh, but the federal government more than any other. The numbers are almost literally unbelievable. Uh, there doesn't seem to be any sense uh, in Ottawa that the money is real, uh, that there is any problem with spending the way they're spending and on the programs that they're they're spending, uh, or that there's any reason uh, for them to limit borrowing. Um, I don't think I need, I'll, I'll, if anybody has questions or comments, but I don't think I need to spend a lot of time uh, talking to uh, this conference about uh, why the money matters and why a lot of the spending is misguided and why borrowing like this is bad. Uh, the key point is that all governments are going to need to cut their own costs in the aftermath of this, uh, because who hasn't felt pain uh, in this crisis? Um, The private sector has really taken it hard. Small businesses, it's been a disaster. Uh, But in the public sector, uh, people are not feeling any pain for the most part. And in fact, for those uh, people in government, and especially this is true in Ottawa, if you've got a defined benefit pension plan, your pension's worth more. 
uh, than it was now because all the yields have fallen. So it, it's going to cost more to provide those pensions than it would have before, and they're going to be worth more to the people who were getting them. And the federal government already had $100 billion more in unfunded pension liabilities for its employees uh, than it was reporting uh, even before the yields fell. Uh, Alberta has its pension challenges as well, and as I think you'll be, I, I, I think you might have discussed this at a, a previous conference that there's quite high compensation in the Alberta public sector. Uh, so we need the feds to shrink, and Alberta also has to get its spending under control and get to a sustainable fiscal position. Or you're always going to be on your back foot, whether you're confronting the federal government or whether you're trying to convince Albertans that you're good to go on your own. Uh, but on that, just coming back to the, the main theme, the last thing I'll say is that I hope you'll come away from this conference with some fresh energy for pushing for a better deal for Alberta inside Canada. I spent a lot of time in the 1990s uh, working through some economic aspects of the constitutional reforms that were under discussion then, and particularly what would happen if Quebec seceded. And I didn't think that secession was a good idea for Quebec. And even though Alberta is economically stronger than Quebec, and Alberta is a net contributor, not a net recipient, I still think secession would involve problems that would be very tough to deal with, all the way from what currency would an independent Alberta use, uh, how would we divide up the assets and the debt, what happens to the trading arrangements and the market access uh, for a landlocked Alberta. And also, one of the things that people really never addressed in the case of Quebec secession is that, you know, once people realize that a breakup is actually happening and you start to run into some of these tough issues, uh, people get bad tempered. And, and uh, you know, again, the, uh, sort of echoing what Barry Cooper said earlier, uh, it's not the economic arguments that end up prevailing in the end. So you can do yourself a lot of uh, extra damage. Um, but even supposing we could get through that stuff without a lot of unnecessary damage, uh, Canada without a major province and a province that has been strong in standing up for provincial rights, so Quebec uh, through time and Alberta through time, uh, that would be a very sad thing for the country uh, as a whole. Uh, the country needs strong provinces if it is going to be a strong federation, and so we need provinces that are going to stand up for the things that matter, uh, whether it's the Fed prov transfers, uh, or other things that Alberta's really been on the forefront of, like free trade within the Federation. And uh, uh, just a, a quick note on that subject, if you really want to grab some attention in Ottawa and, uh, and get people excited, certainly in Quebec and Ontario, uh, on the subject of free trade, why doesn't Alberta uh, strike a very big blow for free trade in the Federation by announcing that it's not going to participate in supply management anymore? Just get rid of the milk quotas. Anybody who wants to produce milk in Alberta and make it into cheese or whatever they want to do with it can do it. Uh, get rid of the chicken and egg quotas. Uh, that would sure provoke some excitement and, and get some attention. Uh, anyway, I had to slip that one in. Uh, whatever you think of that idea, uh, Canada's better off with provinces that protect their own rights, their, their provincial rights, and resist federal encroachment. Uh, they're, Canada's better off with provinces that do a good job in the areas where they're supposed to do a good job. Uh, I do think that strong provinces are a key reason why Canada, uh, discontented though we are with the current direction in Ottawa, and I, you know, I share that, uh, I share that, uh, but it's a key reason why Canada has lasted as long as it has and been as successful as it has. So that's my hope for the future. I really appreciate your having me at this conference. I look forward to your questions and your comments. Uh, I hope that I'll be able to hear them uh, uh, through the, the miking in the room, but if not, uh, please bear with us because I think maybe we'll end up um, repeating them so that I can, uh, so that I can hear them, uh, and I, I look forward to that. Thanks very much. Go ahead. I can hear you. There's a bit of an echo, so bear with me. I'll I'll pay attention, <laughs> and if, if it doesn't work, then maybe we'll have somebody uh, just uh, come in and repeat. Thanks. Uh, 
Is that turned down all the way? Sorry, Bill. Yep, quite all right. I, we're all we're all working through this. Okay. Sure, try that. Testing. Testing. Okay, Bill. You should be able to hear us now. I can There's, hear uh, you. No feedback. Okay, can you can hear us now? I can. I can. Okay. So Rob here is going to ask you a question. <laughs> Yeah, hi, hi, Bill. Uh, you mentioned the Alberta Pension Plan. Um, I'd like for you, if possible, to go through some of the dynamics on that. Obviously, you've talked about how Alberta has a younger demographic. Uh, I remember when Martin wanted to go from 5.5 .5 to 9.9. .9, all we needed was Ralph Klein not to go ahead with it. He did because, I don't know, he had some disagreement with Preston Manning. If you can go into that, because I think for people here, they need to hear about the specifics with regard to why we're better off eventually. Okay, now Bill, we're gonna it's mute it. the iPad. Hold on, I'm gonna mute the iPad. And Chris is gonna turn up the volume of the MacBook. Well, if, I, if I'm if i coming through all right, uh, Rob, thanks for the question. It's really a matter of the numbers, uh, the key ones that I mentioned being that Alberta has a younger, higher earning population. And so that means that the contribution base is bigger and that the, uh, that, that, um, the length of time when you've got that strong contribution base before the population gets older and the benefits start to get relatively bigger uh, lasts for longer than it would than in the rest of the country. So the numbers that you mentioned, um, I had worked out something that was a bit less dramatic than that, um, but it was the case, what, what you could have said to Albertans then as you can now is, uh, we can provide you the same benefits that the Canada Pension Plan is providing you, uh, and the contributions are going to be lower. Uh, so the, the, the main argument that I heard against that from the point of view of just how the economics work out is that uh, if Alberta is younger now, the day may come when Alberta is relatively older, uh, and there are lots of economic cycles, as everybody knows, and so you can't uh, take for granted that an uh, advantage that you have at the beginning uh, is going to last forever, and that is true, but pension plans are very dependent on where you start out, and so that initial uh, younger and higher earning population means that in those first few years, what you're able to do is you're able to build up a bigger kitty. And by the time the transition comes where you're more dependent on the payouts from that uh, in order to pay the benefits, uh, you, you, you can bake in that advantage. So that is, that is true now uh, as it was then. And the questions that I raised earlier are really the ones that you have to wrestle with, including uh, do you trust yourselves with the money? It's a, it's a happy historical accident. Uh, you know, I'm a fan of federalism. This one uh, was kind of incidental, but because of the shared jurisdiction on pensions, the Canada Pension Plan Investment Board has this structure where you've got joint governance of the feds and the provinces. And it's very hard for somebody uh, just acting, uh, uh, you know, by, by, by himself to say, okay, now we're going to, you know, pursue some crazy industrial policy with this or use it to subsidize lobster fishermen or something. Um, so the CPP has fairly good armor. Uh, the question for me would be, uh, and I think a lot of Albertans would ask this question, you know, can you build a similar kind of safety around the Alberta pension plan, um, that, that, that fund, so that you're protected from some of the things that might otherwise happen? Okay, another question now. Hi, Bill, Danny. Hi, Danny. Hi, okay. Bill. Uh, I'm, I mean, if anyone else has a question, if they'll come and stand behind me after I've got done mine, if, if, if we have time, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll go to that. We'll take the questions from here. But Bill, I'm intrigued by your, uh, 
your concept of uh, eliminating supply management, are you just suggesting that the Alberta government would just say, look, we're not going to, we're not going to live by the supply management rules. Anybody that wants to raise or you know, milk or raise chickens or turkeys or whatever, they can just do it. And uh, the, the, the federal government would have to deal with the people who had a quota. Is that, is that what you're suggesting? Yeah, the provinces and the federal government really collaborate uh, in this cartel. And uh, I, 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 it's probably unnecessary since you said you were intrigued by it, but I, I think supply management is a, it's a terrible system. Uh, for all kinds of uh, reasons, it's 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 unfair to consumers. Uh, it's really bad for the competitiveness of our food processing industry, and it fragments the internal market because you've got these barriers at every provincial border. You can't transfer quota across it, and you have to restrict uh, the the trade and all, all the all the products. So why not uh, one province? Uh, map out a, a relaxation of that where you're saying we're going to operate outside this system. Uh, there's nothing in the Constitution that says the federal government has control over agriculture. So I think that would be worth looking at. I, I'm, I'm surprised I don't hear more about it and maybe there's some reason why uh, uh, it, it wouldn't work. Uh, it wouldn't kind of throw a grenade into the whole system the way that I think it would. Um, but uh, I, I share the frustration of uh, Albertans when it comes to getting the attention uh, of the federal government generally, uh, and especially right now. Uh, I share the frustration about the fact that there are some major provinces, uh, including the one I'm in right now, uh, that, uh, uh, you know, that just don't sh seem to uh, get that motivated about dealing with some of these things. Um, a threat to supply management would sure get people's attention. So um, I think it's worth looking at. And if it did end up blowing up the system, I mean, I'd certainly applaud that. It seems to be very hard to get rid of any other way. Okay, another question here. Uh, oh, hi, Bill. It's Tom Flanagan. Um, Tom. Question about the enormous debts that our governments are taking on. Do you think these are going to become inflationary uh, down the road? Is there any way to actually borrow real money, or is it going, money just going to be created and thereby raise the price level? At the moment, there isn't inflationary pressure from this for a couple of reasons. One is that uh, there is just all this saving right now. People are saying, where can I put my money where it's safe? And as a result, uh, there is just ample supply for, for the governments uh, that are doing all this borrowing. And uh, what that means is that the central banks, even though they're taking on all this debt, there isn't that kind of force feeding of debt into the central banks uh, that you would worry about if governments were having trouble financing themselves in, in other ways. So the, de the, the bonds that the central banks are absorbing are more uh, at the volition of the central banks as they're trying to support credit markets, make sure that uh, everything continues to trade. Uh, and the other reason why we're not seeing any inflationary pressure right now is because the money that gets created when the central banks are buying all these bonds is mostly just sitting inside the central banks uh, themselves or, or you know, sitting in the payment system not doing very much because there isn't a lot of demand for credit. So uh, it's not moving around. It's not supporting spending and, and contributing to inflationary pressure the way that it one day might. So at the, the, the trouble is that that benign environment is probably uh, encouraging people who kind of think this is neat uh, to imagine that you could just continue to do this indefinitely. So even though it's okay right now, and even though I'm not worried about inflation right now, I think that the, uh, the, the advocates of what they call modern monetary theory, there's nothing modern about it, it's the oldest trick in the book, uh, are, are going to be taking uh, uh, courage from this and pointing to this and saying, look, this just proves that you can finance your uh, deficits by printing money uh, without limit. And it, it's that kind of attitude that would get us into trouble after a year or two, uh, because there does come a point when neither of the things that I said is true. The uh, appetite for people just to buy endless amounts of government debt begins to wane. People start to worry and it's, they start to ask for more of a premium when they lend. And that money that's currently sitting, not doing very much, starts to move around. 
and starts to support spending. And then we see some inflationary pressure from there. So uh, I almost wish that the problems that I've just described were uh, with us right here and now, and that I could answer your question by saying, yes, there's inflationary pressure right at the moment, because then I think people would be quicker to react against it. What we have to watch out for is that a lot of people are going to look at this situation and see, look, uh, you can do this indefinitely. So uh, longer term, yes, I definitely uh, worry along the lines of what you said. Okay, another question. Well, thanks, Bill. It's a privilege to have you here presenting. Uh, my question is going back to supply management. Are, are we running a, a, a trade deficit here in Alberta? And if we were to get rid of the sacred uh, cow or sacred chicken or sacred egg, um, would we be able to uh, expand it here in Alberta because Quebec gets such a, a, a large share of the quota system? And the biggest question I have, though, is would we need to compensate those people that have the quota and paid for the quota? Or because we have an undersupply, it could just be opened up and no real problems here would be great problems for those that are exporting to the other provinces like Quebec? I'll take uh, I'll take the second part of that question first and say that I think that if you're the federal government and we see this when they do international trade negotiations, if you're making concessions that uh, erode the control of the domestic producers of the of the market that's inside these cartels, um, you do have some kind of I, maybe it's a moral obligation, certainly as a political reality, uh, providing some compensation makes sense because the farmers that did well out of this system were the ones who were in at the beginning. That was decades ago. Uh, they're uh, out of the business now. Uh, and so the people that are currently in the system might reasonably say, look, uh, you set this up for us and then you and then you changed the rules. So how about some compensation? So I, I get that argument. Uh, but interprovincially, I don't think the same argument applies. Um, it doesn't seem to me to, that, that, the, the, that any province has an obligation to any other province. So uh, maybe that's a subject of negotiation, but uh, uh, I don't think that there's any kind of starting point that says compensation is due. Um, on the question of how competitive Alberta would be, uh, I don't know for sure. My, my, my suspicion is that uh, you'd see uh, a, a, some changes in the balance of trade within the country and that some of the areas that just have some natural advantages when it comes to agriculture, uh, you know, the West generally would probably do well out of the system. It's, it's, the reason it's hard to say is because when you've got a really protected cartelized system, everybody feels inefficient. Everybody feels like they need the protection. Uh, everybody worries about having it uh, taken away. You saw this if you go back to the free trade debate. Uh, over over Canada U.S. free trade, we had a lot of dire predictions about parts of the economy that were just going to get completely hammered, uh, and they the reason they felt that way was because their input costs were high, the market that they had available was small, and a lot of the businesses had just been used to this protected environment. And then when the trade barriers went away, we found that we had all kinds of uh, competitive advantages that we had never known we had. I remember this is just a, a weird one, but it was so weird it stayed in my head that after while the Americans started to complain that men's suits from Canada were swamping the American producers. Like, whoever thought we would have a, a competitive advantage in men's wool suits? It just was one of those things that came out once you freed up the market. So I don't know for sure, uh, but my, my expectation is that we would find that we had, uh, certainly in the Western provinces and then in the country as a whole, a much more dynamic, efficient industry than uh, what, we, what we expected. So I, 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 I admit I'm kind of uh, uh, projecting some of my own preferences here. It might seem funny at a conference like this to have supply management come up that way, uh, but it would sure be nice to have Alberta rattle the bars of the cage. And I think that uh, probably the, uh, the producers in Alberta, like everybody else, they'd be nervous about losing the, the, the protection. Um, but if you've got that bigger market and you're a competitive producer, then in the long run, you're going to be much better off.